And you know, names, names are important, though. Names really are. I don't know how you as parents, you, you did it, but we tried to give our, our names, sig- children significant names so that they would have a, a little understanding. And so we just, we, we personally, we prayed about it, and then we gave names. Sometimes you hit, sometimes you don't. But I think when the names are given to God in the Bible, it's not hit and miss. They are specific and they are special, especially when God gives names to somebody that he's going to send who will be known as the Messiah. Uh, The Israelite people, the Jewish people, they were waiting for somebody that God would send who would rescue them from the evil of sin and of other nations and would be their king and their ruler. And so God told them for years, uh, hundreds of years, that he was going to raise up somebody from the family of Abraham. He would be a kingly ruler from the line of David, and he would be a great king, even better than the King David. And he would be the faithful Israelite. He would fulfill perfectly everything that I've commanded them. And he will be a Messiah. So when we look at those names, those are really important because they tell us, and we're looking at four names, they tell us what kind of Savior God is going to give to us. And they tell us, what that Savior will be to us. So we've been looking at these four names of God that he gives to a Savior, and it gives us a little indication of what kind of Savior he will be to us. And this is our scripture in Isaiah 9, 6. It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And he and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful counselor. So this king, this leader, he's going to come and he's going to have a kingdom and a government. And this is his name. These are the things that he will be to us. He will be to us a wonderful counselor. He will be to us mighty God. So this is not just, you know, a person. This is mighty God. He will be to us everlasting father. He will be to us prince of peace. And then verse 7, I I wanted to include that because I think it's so important. And the greatness of his government and his peace, there will be no end. So right off the bat, God says, this Messiah that I send, this is not just the Jewish Messiah. This is not just for those people. This is for all the world. And his kingdom, when he comes, it will spread. And the influence of his kingdom will spread to all the nations and all the peoples of, of the world. Not only does it tell us what kind of Savior that he'll be, but it tells us uh, about four different things that they really needed and that we really need. And so this is, these are things that they had problems with that they really needed solution for. And here, here was their big problem. There were other nations that were more powerful and more evil than them that were being raised up, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians, and they were going to come and they were going to destroy the Israelites. And that's eventually what actually happened in history. And they needed wisdom, and they needed protection, and they needed somebody who would look out for their interests, who would protect, defend, and provide for them, and care for them like a father. And they needed somebody who would eventually bring peace. And so God says, the wonderful counselor that I'm sending you, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, the mighty God, he will be all of these things to you. He will be your source of wisdom. He will be your source of protection. He will be the father that you need. And he will be the one who will eventually bring peace to you. And I think, today we're going to talk about everlasting father. And I I think... The the scripture there. He will be called to you everlasting father. I think if there's anything that we need as a society, and especially as an American culture, if there's any relationship that needs to be redeemed or restored or magnified to its, its significance, if there's anything that you and I long for, it is this desire to have a compassionate and tender father that will care for us that will protect us, that will provide for us, and that will love us with a true, genuinely fatherly care. In fact, I believe that because of the way that we're created, and I think the Bible bears this out, we were created and there is a craving in our heart for this kind of a perfect father. And and some of us, we've had great fathers. So some of us, or you had a great father. Uh, This week, the passing of the 41st president, George H.W. Bush happened, and there is just some really tender moments. Uh, This guy, obviously, him and his dad had a great relationship with his daddy. This moment where he touches the casket. You know, other people have have done that before in history, and other people did that for, for that. But there's something different when he did it. I mean, there's just a real tenderness, and you could tell that he had a really cherished and special relationship with his daddy. Uh... 
some of us have not had that kind of relationship with our daddy. In fact, I, I'd probably say that most of us may not have had that kind of relationship with our daddy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk about four fatherly wounds that you and I can receive. And I'm not doing this to bring up, you know, your, your painful past or things that are uncomfortable. And so I, I'm asking you to st- stick in here, to bear in here, to don't close yourself off from this. Because my point is to highlight how amazing God's promise to give us an everlasting father is. To show us the good that God gives us. Because I, I'll tell you, I had a great daddy. I did. Man, I love my dad. My dad is still alive. I, I was just thinking the other day of how difficult it's going to be to be able to let him go beyond with Jesus. We don't even live in the same place. So he, ha- he has an incredible impact on my life. But my dad also was just a man. And he failed and he disappointed me and I'm sure I did the same exact thing. So there is still a wounding that I have with what I think is one of the greatest daddies that I've ever seen or experienced. And we all have, no matter how perfect, our dads are human. They fail, they disappoint, and we all bear some kind of wound. But these, these four kinds of, of wounds that we bear can be significant. So I'm just going to go through them and just touch on them just a little bit. Our earthly fathers at that time can be an absent dad. In fact, some of us, we grew up in homes where dad just left. He was just never around. And, and honestly, for some of us, it wasn't intended. It wasn't intended. Your, your dad just passed away at an early age when you were just young, and he just missed a big portion of your life, and that left a big wound or hole in your heart and in your, your experience. And some of us have had... Uh, of daddies that were there physically, but they weren't there. And, and, I, and I, as, a, as a daddy who works really hard to serve the church and serve my family, I know exactly what that's like. And it is the, it is the worst feeling to be there at the dinner table, present physically, but my mind is thinking about the email or the situation. You know, dads, you know how that is, right? And you're not there present. And that not being there, that absentee, dad can leave in us the feeling of rejection whether it was intended or not we just feel a certain sense of rejection and we work really hard to not feel just in the tank when we're alone or this nagging suspicion that the good in life will just go away and in particular these things shape our view of our heavenly father and so it's just that feeling of you know are, are you gonna leave me too whether you've ever voiced it or not, we just have that nagging. And the next one is just, it's never satisfied dad. It's just the never satisfied dad. It's just the feeling of always being disappointed. And I, I know this really well, not from my dad, but from my, my mom's dad. Half my family is Japanese. And my, my, on my Japanese side, my grandfather was a very stoic man. Very stoic. And if anything, gave the impression that he was never satisfied or approving of anything. He had, he had seven kids. I see the mark in their lives, but even as a grandson, it, it left a mark in my life as well. His way of saying you did a good job, if he ever did it, was not bad. Not bad. I mean, and, and on, you know, we live in an Asian culture. It's, it's common. It's just the dad who expresses himself as never being satisfied. So with us, in relation to God, it, it makes us feel feel like, or I shouldn't say makes us feel like, causes us to feel like we got to work and work and work to prove that I'm worth being approved. And so you go and you go and you do all these things for God, hoping, and, it, and it's elusive. The more we do, the more we feel like we got to do, and we're trying to grab something that can never be grabbed because of the environment that we grew up in. Again, I think this one is really big, especially because of our Asian culture. It's just the emotionally distant dad. The emotionally, the, the, the dad that was emotionally, you just never really felt the affection or the love or the, the warmth. Uh, in, in, the, you know, in the period from 1945 to 1980, statistically it's shown that about 50% of the dads of the nuclear families of that generation, 1945 to 1980, were those kind of dads. I mean, they were great dads. They were stable, they provided for the family, but they weren't emotionally connected 
with their families. They, they, they didn't gush and, and express verbally, man, I love you, and you're doing great, and I'm so proud of you, and man, you do that well. They just didn't do that. Their way of showing love and affection was, I provide, I put dinner on the table, I'm here, I'm faithful to your mom. All that's awesome, but there's this emotional connection that we lose, and even as we grow up, then we begin to have a difficulty emotionally connecting with others, our, our wife, other people, and in particular, even God, and just being able to communicate the emotions that we have. So we got these things going on, and we just kind of bury them or stuff them down because I don't know how to express what's going on here. And so there's the emotionally distant dad. And then the, the last one is just the it's a time bomb dad. You just never knew what might happen to set them off. And if you're the youngest of a, of a family, you're always trying to make peace in your home because you've seen the older brother and the second brother or sister and the third one set them off. And so you're just trying, because you don't want and you don't know what it's going to do, what's going to happen at any given moment. And if you add alcohol or you add drugs or any other thing to that, then it just intensifies and magnifies the whole thing. And that, that leaves a mark on our lives. You know that emotionally distant dad, Bo Jackson? How many of you remember Bo Jackson? I'm going back, back a little bit. Bo Jackson was, was arguably, especially in his day, one of the greatest athletes of all time. I mean, he was a dual sport guy, and he was elite at both of his dual sports. He was an amazing baseball player, amazing football player, had a, a just really freak tragic ending to his career. But in 1995, when it was all about Bo knows everything, there was one thing that Bo didn't know. Bo didn't know the emotional connection and love of his daddy. And in a Sports Illustrated article, he says this, my father has never seen me play football. Think, think about this. I mean, this is the elite football player in the world at the time, one of them anyway. Can you imagine? Here I am, Bo Jackson, one of the so-called premier athletes in the country, and I'm still in the locker room envying every one of my teammates whose dad would come in and talk and have a drink with them after the game. I never experience that the, you you can you can feel it i mean there's no amount of success or achievement that can take the place of that so whatever your your reason is today whatever you might have experienced uh, some of us when we say okay we're going to talk about everlasting father it, it's kind of like really you know, when we say G God sent Jesus to be our everlasting father, it's like, man, can we just fast forward through this one? Because it's just painful. I was reading an article in, um, in a, on a blog by a group called the Gospel Coalition. And in the blog, there is a guy who writes about his experience. And this is how he describes his own experience. He's now, he's now married and he's a daddy. He says this, I was about 25 years old before I could say the word father while praying because of the kind of relationship or he said lack thereof that I had with my own dad it just didn't roll off my tongue the way that it did for many of my other Christian friends he asked this question as he's, he's thinking because how could I come to God without fear when I'd been scared to go home whenever dad was there or how could I understand God's love and faithfulness when dad left town because he loved something or someone else more than me how can God be a mighty fortress of protection when my dad hit instead of hug? It's, it's painful. It's painful. The, the really unfortunate part of this is that this is, this is more common and more the norm, unfortunately, and has made a huge impact in many of our lives. And here's what it does. It shapes the way that we understand the Heavenly Father. It shapes the way that we see the everlasting Father. It shapes the way that we approach and that we have relationship with God. And so as we continue on in this, I've got good news about this name, Everlasting Father, that God gives to us through Jesus. The good news is that Jesus actually came into the earth to show us what the Father's love would look like. Not, not just to teach about it. He just didn't come drop off a manual and go, here's how God loves you. He came to actually show us how the Father in heaven would love you and I. He, that's, what, that's what he came to do. And he came to heal us of 
our own earthly father wounds by becoming the everlasting father. And so as, we're, as, we, as you're listening this morning, I want to I wanna invite you to do something challenging, and this is what I'm going to invite you to do. In order to take a step of healing, you and I have to sw- switch the way that we see Heavenly Father and the way that we see our earthly father. Because most of the time what we do is we look at our Heavenly Father and who He is and expectations from Him through the lens of our earthly Father. And instead of doing that, we need to begin viewing and we need to begin seeing and we need to begin loving and understanding our earthly Father through the lens of our Heavenly Father. That takes for you and I the, ch- the choice that we have to make. I'm going to choose to, instead of relating to God and seeing God through the lens of my earthly father, I'm going to instead understand my earthly father through the lens of my heavenly one. So I want to look at a a, a parable, it's a story that Jesus tells. This is going to be so helpful because no matter how great your father was or is, he is just a man and he is not the ultimate father that God wants to give you and I and that our hearts crave and that our hearts long for. So no matter how good he is, if you're looking to him to be your heavenly father, you're looking in the wrong place. God has given you and I a heavenly father and he's given you and I Jesus to be the everlasting father. And so Jesus is interacting with people. He's interacting with people who are a lot different than he is. They're poor, they're beaten down, they're the oppressed of society, they're not the religious scholars, they're not the, you know, the elite, they're not the wealthy. They're all the people that people have said, you know what, those are kind of, if Those are the outcasts, and Jesus is spending a lot of time with them. And the religious leaders, they come to him and they say, Jesus, why are you spending so much time with them? And he's going to tell this story to show us what the love of God really looks like. And he's going to show, he's going to tell this story to show us that there is a father that wants to love us in a way that we could be loved by no other father. And so he tells this story. It's, it's a story of the prodigal. Some of you, you've already read that. It's been turned into paintings. Rembrandt did this beautiful, amazing one. Um, and he's going to tell the story about the prodigal. Now, as we're going in, into the story, let me just say this real quick, theologically. It's weird, I think, to sometimes think that the son, okay, as followers of Christ, we believe that the, the scriptures clearly show that God is one God in three persons, three distinct, co-eternal, co-existent persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that. We believe the Bible clearly shows that. But here it says that the Son, the child that will be given, is going to be to you an everlasting Father. So what does that mean? Let me just tell you what it doesn't mean, and I'll tell you what I think it means for you and I. It doesn't mean that somehow God and Jesus just kind of becomes God the Father. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't, become, it doesn't mean that God is just one entity and he just flips a switch to turn into a different mode. That's actually a heretical doctrine called modalism. God is just this one entity who flips on the switch, become the Father. It's not that. We believe in the Trinity, which means that God, although he is, there is one God, he exists in the form of three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Son is going to come and He is going to, here's what I believe it means, He's going to love us like the Father that you and I crave. He is going to show us in His tenderness and in His compassion what the love of our God who is our Father is like. And He will be to you and I a Father in the way that He loves us. Okay? He will be, so... Jesus will be the father that we've always, always longed for. And so in response to the religious leader's question, here is this story that he tells. You guys may be familiar with it, and here's how it goes. There was a man who had, imagine he's telling this for a particular reason. There's a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So let me just describe what is being said in those, those short words. When he says, give me my share of the estate, this is basically saying, when you die, I'm going to get your estate. And I don't want to wait for you to die. I want it now. So this is almost as if he is saying to the dad, I wish you were dead so that I could have what belongs to me. That's literally what he's saying. In their culture, in their context, everybody in the audience would have gone like, whoa. Now look, the shame gets even worse because family property was a big deal 
back in their day. That, that defined their family. And so he had to, in order to get cash for property, he takes his share of the property that the father divides. He goes and he sells it so that he can get cash. So on top of the shame of saying, I wish you're dead, he basically takes the property that is the value of the family and he sells it so that he can get cash. And he just goes off on this journey to spend it. And here's what it says as he goes on. Not long after that, the younger son, he got everything together, everything that he had, and he set off for a distant country. And I love it in the same sentence. It says, and there he squandered all his wealth and wild living. In one sentence, he gets it all together, he takes it all, and he goes to Vegas and he just blows it all. Just blows it all. Everything. In a time when there is an incredible drought and famine. In a time now where he is really suffering and struggling. He's spent it all. He's hungry. He's hurting. He's in pain. And the father, from beginning to end of the story, I want you to recognize that he is bearing the pain of the son. He's bearing the, he's bearing the shame of hearing his own son say, I wish you were dead. And by the way, I'm taking everything that belongs to this family and I'm not going to get rid of it. I don't really respect it. He's bearing all the pain of that, but he does it with grace. And generously, he lets his son go, and he lets his son do all this. And if you've ever seen, I have five kids. They're all teenagers now. At one point or another, they've all set off on a little journey. And if you're a parent, you know the pain when that child sets off. And when I say set off, when they leave the home. It is is like no other pain. And this father, Jesus, is saying, he lets it happen. He bears the pain of it. Well, he's having a great time until he's not having a great time anymore. And then he's hungry and he's hurting and there's a famine and he finds himself doing the most unlikely thing. I I think this is really ironic. He is feeding pigs. He goes and he gets a job feeding pigs. I'm going to tell you how bad this is. And not only is he feeding pigs, but as he's feeding pigs, he is so hungry. He's probably not even making minimum wage. He's so hungry, he's starting to dream about eating the pig food. Now, this is a Jewish guy. And in their culture, pigs were unclean. You didn't even touch them, let alone eat them, let alone serve them, let alone, I want to eat their food. So he is just in the bottom of shame and humiliation at this point. And so he gets this idea. There must have been something about his dad in the story that we're not told, but he kind of gets. And he says this, when he came to his senses, this moment brings him to this reality. How many of my father's servants have more food to spare? Here I am, I'm starving to death. So he's thinking, at least I can humble myself, go back home. And become a servant at my dad's house. So not long after that, the younger son, he got everything he had. Or I'm sorry. Uh, he said, I'll sit out and I'm going to go back home to my father's house. And I'll say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You can kind of imagine him just like he's rehearsing this as he's going home. I want to show genuine humility. I don't want him to, I am desperate right now. You know, I know I've caused the family a lot of shame, but I want him to think that I'm genuine about this. So I'm going to go home and say this. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Just make me a servant. And so he got up and he went to his father. And so in the context of his audience, you could imagine they're thinking, this is, this is like in the movie where, Oh, this is the big turning point. The son is going to go and face now the criticism of his dad. Now, I want to tell you why they probably thought this, because they had really wrong ideas about God in their era. They thought oftentimes that God was really cruel, that he was harsh, that he was just waiting for a moment to go, bam, and judge them. See, I told you. You made your bed, now you lie in it. You're getting exactly what you deserve. You did that, you wanted that, that's what you get. That's what they thought. So when he says, I'm going to go back home, everybody's like, oh, no, he's not. It would be better for you to die than go back home and face the the cruel and fierce anger of your daddy. And then Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, flips this whole thing up and says, you know what? Your daddy is not like you've experienced or like you see. He is totally different. And so he says when he goes back, but the son, while the son was still a long way off, 
His father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, and he goes through his speech, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I love this. The father doesn't even let him finish. He's about to beg to have a job as a servant. The father just goes, look, everybody, bring, bring, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Bring the ring, put it on his fingers. Bring the sandal, put it on his feet. He says, he's basically saying, I know you don't feel like you're worthy to be a part of this family, but I'm going to make sure that anybody who doesn't think you're worthy knows that I'm welcoming you back. Like Matt said earlier, the light is on, the door is open. No, no, no. Shame, come back. And he covers all of his shame with this celebration. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead. I don't even care about that. He's alive now. He's back home. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate with incredible joy. And from beginning to end of the story, God is bearing the pain and the shame of his son. He's bearing the shame when he leaves, and then he covers the shame when he comes back with this joy and celebration. And I want to look, as we just bring this to a focus today, about just three aspects of your heavenly father that are so different from the absent father, that are so different from the, you know, never satisfied father or the emotionally distant father or for the time bomb father Three aspects of our Father, and we see him in the Scripture. This is what it says. While he was still a long way off. Now think about this. He was emotionally connected with his son. He was not good as long as his son was wandering and not there. And he sees his son coming from a distance, which means that he must have been looking for his son coming from a distance. And can you imagine this? If you've ever had your kids leave the home, you you can't do anything. You, you can't just go to sleep. When my, you know, this is one of our, our peeves in our family. We got your phone. Answer the phone. And so when the kids don't answer the phone, you're not just going, oh, I'm sure they're okay. You're going, no, 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 no. The worst thing has happened. We start calling hospitals and trying to find them. You know, many, you know about three or four anniversaries ago, there was a shark sighting at Makapu. And my, kid, my son was going out surfing that night. But hey, Mom. Sharks really, they're, they're nice. You know, they only do that. They only bite to test and see if that's food. And so he goes out surfing, and, son, and my wife is like, as soon as you get out of the water, you call us. <laughs> okay, Mom, I'll do that. Six o'clock hits, and we're out to dinner at this nice restaurant, and she is not eating her food at all. And she's going in and out of the restaurant calling him. And the night, son goes down, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And it's about 8 o'clock at night. She hasn't touched any of her food. Now, I touched it all. It was amazing. <laughs> but she didn't. So I, finally, after, I just said, you know what, honey? Let's just go and look for him already because this, this is not good for anybody here. And so we go and we, we uh, I'm just going to finish the story. We, we go and look for him. And it turns out he had left his phone in somebody else's car. He was at youth already. And so we wanted to hug him. But... <laughs> But there's just a pain in not knowing. And you as a parent cannot be good as long as you do not know what your son or daughter are doing and they're wandering. God's saying, I'm the same way. And can you imagine him day after day, week after week, month after month, coming out on his lanai or whatever it looked like and just looking, waiting, hoping for the, fa- for the son's return. And then off in a distance, he sees him coming. And he does the most uncharacteristic thing. He hikes up his robe and he runs in a dignified culture. They didn't do this. He doesn't care. He sees his son coming and so he's full on sprint of an old man out to his son and he doesn't hug him like that. He literally, the scripture really says he falls on him and he kisses him and he's just relieved. My son is home. Your heavenly Father and the everlasting Father is the furthest thing from being an emotionally disconnected dad. He is always, always, always caring for you and I. Always. He's not good as long as you're not there. He cares. And he longs for your return. And when he does, he covers your shame with celebration. And the scripture goes on to say this. He was there a long way off. He runs out there and he's just got this compassion that's overflowing. It's not this angry. He's not wagging his finger going, you know what, I told you so. See? See? 
You want to do it? See, you got what you got. You're not welcome here. He doesn't say any of that. In fact, he stops him from giving a speech. And he just says, come on and bring everything out because my son was dead, but now he's back home. He is compassionate. He is the complete opposite. If you grew up in a home where you had an angry dad, he was like a time bomb and everybody walked on eggshells around him. He is the complete opposite of that. He is a compassionate dad. He longs to have us back in home with him. Psalm 103 describes him like this. The Lord is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in love. God is not quick to anger. He is slow to anger. There are times, though, when God will discipline us. He will spank us. And He will allow us to go through things as a form of discipline, consequences of our sinful behavior. That does happen. But it's never because He hates you or is angry at you or wants to destroy you. It's always for your good. In fact, the author of Hebrews says this, God is like a father and he will discipline you like a good father. But he says even your perfect, fa- even your good fathers on earth, sometimes they do it out of anger. But your heavenly father, your everlasting father, he never disciplines you out of anger. Those were his children. He doesn't discipline you out of anger. He disciplines you for your good. He is a compassionate and loving God. And his compassion, his mercy, they never run out. And then finally, as we come to this last part here. At the very end, remember, just from the very beginning to the very end, he's just covering and bearing the pain. And so he says this, this son of mine was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he's found so they begin to celebrate together like this celebration was real important because even though this was in the father's heart you got to imagine that everybody else in the family was like why would the father treat his son like that they're all making big harsh judgment and so the father says i'm going to make it very clear how i see this situation and i don't care what you think or how you judge this father is going to cover his shame with celebration is going to cover the, the disappointment and everything that he's caused. He's going to cover it with celebration. And he is back in this family. So that's it. And there is just, instead of being an absent dad, he is always there. He's there from the beginning. When he bears the shame of us leaving, he's there at the end. When he covers the shame with just this incredible celebration, he is always, always, always there. He never stops being there. In fact, Hebrews 13 says this. Hebrews 13, speaking of Jesus, says this, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. That's what God says to you and I. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. He is your everlasting Father. He is the one who will never pass away. As great as our fathers on this earth may be, our fathers will eventually die. And when that happens, that will leave a hole in our heart. But God says, I am the Father that your heart ultimately longs for, and I will never pass away. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. And I will never die. And when we come into a relationship with Him, and when we know Him, that relationship and that fatherly care, it lasts for the rest of eternity. It will never, ever end. And the thing that our hearts crave and the thing that our hearts long for, and worship team, come and join me this morning. God says it will never, ever run out. So I want to I encourage you. Jesus came to be for you and I, everlasting Father. He is the Father that our hearts long for. Regardless of whether you've had a great Father or not so. And God wants to heal us of our father wounds. And the way that we take steps towards that is when we stop, we stop judging our heavenly father by our earthly father. And we begin loving our earthly father through the lens of our heavenly father who came into the earth for you and I, who became a child that we celebrate at Christmas time, who didn't come to judge us. He came to save us. He came to die on a cross in our place. 
L- listen to me. Stay with me. I know we hear this, and those of you who've been in church, you hear this, and it just kind of rolls off our back. He covered our shame from beginning to end. He died on a cross in our place so that he could show you and not just tell you, but demonstrate how much he loves you. That is your everlasting father. Knowing him and knowing that gives me the courage I need to stop looking at him through the lens of my earthly father and to start looking at my earthly father through the lens of my heavenly father who died on a cross to forgive me of my sins so that I can have not only the example but the power to forgive my earthly father who's just a man who fell short, who disappointed, and who hurt. But the heavenly father, the everlasting father, he will never do that. Jesus proved that when he walked on the earth. He didn't just say it. He demonstrated so you and I could have the confidence 